Welcome to the Microbiology Journal Club. So this is our post-Thanksgiving edition. Um, I think we're going to be, it's, it's basically going to be me and Nicole, <laughs> because I think everyone else is in the thick of things with the end of the semester, and also maybe just recovering a bit from the Thanksgiving break. I will note that um, I've seen a couple of people on Twitter uh, who tweeted that they were interested in the journal club, or maybe they just found the hashtag, which is uh, microjc on Twitter. Um, I think the microseminar folks also plugged us, so thanks, you guys. I really appreciate that. Um, absolutely, if uh, people found us on Twitter and you're interested in joining us, we always welcome new people. Um, we kind of wax and wane and fluctuate based uh, of our of our group based on people's commitments and so forth. It's very informal. Um, even if you've only had a chance to kind of glance at the paper, that's okay too. We certainly don't test anybody. There's no pop quizzes or anything like that. Um, so if folks are watching or have run across our hashtag and you're interested in joining us, definitely take a look at the website. It's um, G plus micro JC wordpress.com and it has a lot of information including uh, little synopses of all our past journal clubs and our past summer book clubs uh, so we're happy to have new people join us uh, before we launch into our current paper paper I'll just introduce myself so my name is Laura Williams I'm an assistant professor at Providence College in Providence Rhode Island and then I'm gonna let Nicole introduce herself Hello, everyone. I'm Nicole Sukdio, and I am a sessional instructor at the University of Northern British Columbia, where I will be teaching microbiology next semester, and hopefully knowing all the microbiology that I've forgotten by the time next semester starts. Yay. I think that's like a good slogan, knowing all the microbiology, <laughs> period. <laughs> we'll try, we'll try. Um, are you guys going to do any uh, primary literature stuff in your microbiology class? No, I've sort of been vehemently warned and looking at like our curriculum, which is kind of a bobsled ride through 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 the Prescott textbook. Like there's a lot there. What I've been trying to focus on are some of the examples, like with Riftia, I want to spiral that through the curriculum just because it's a cool microbial ecology story that allows you to bring in the other modes of metabolism. So I'm trying to find examples that have some really cool pieces that apply, you know, that have been documented in the primary literature. I'd love to bring in some new stuff and maybe it will, but right now it's Going with really just got. trying to align with, with what has been taught previously. That makes sense. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, I will mention that for people who are teaching who, who either now or in the future, because um, Nicole, if you if you continue to teach, you might find that you want to bring in primary literature when you have more of a chance to. Um, we, I mean, this is also a good uh, forum for kind of auditioning papers. So if there's people out there who have a paper that you're thinking about um, using in a class and you want to just get a read through um, with a group, we're always happy to do that too. So we always take suggestions for papers. Yeah, and I think I recall seeing that Dr. Kat Milligan Myrie was thinking of actually discussing the paper that we're talking about today. That's in her right. Class. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So we'll try to do a good job of that for Kat. <laughs> um, okay. So the paper we're talking about today is this one Selection of Functional Quorum Sensing Systems by Lysogenic Bacteriophages in Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So it's, a, it's phage, it's pseudomonas, it's cheating cheaters who cheat a lot. And, and also and, a poor moth who kind of gets sick at the end. So. Oh, right. That's right. Yeah. And a moth. I mean, it's got everything, you guys. Yeah. It's a great paper. Um, I'm going to start out by saying I, for whatever reason, I'm having a little bit of a hard time with the, the way that they've chosen to kind of frame this. So we're going we're gonna to start out by talking about quorum sensing. So quorum sensing is... Uh, a mechanism by which bacteria can collect information about how many there are of them. So bacteria, a single bacterial cell can kind of get some information about the numbers of bacteria in its vicinity and the cell density in its vicinity. Um, and this is done by the production of specific compounds that the bacteria can detect that then usually turn on or off certain gene expression. Um, or change gene expression. So the, the, I think the potentially the most well-known example of this is probably Vibrio fischeri um, and, the, and the bioluminescent light organ of the squid. 
So the Hawaiian bobtail squid has a light organ on its ventral side that's colonized by Vibrio fisheri. Vibrio fisheri have a set of genes that help them produce luciferase. And so if they are in high enough numbers, the quorum sensing mechanism is going to make the compounds that signal that they're in high density, and that kicks on the luciferase, and that means that the bacteria start to glow, and then the squid have light produced from the light organ. Do you know, uh, Nicole, that, that was the one that I knew of. Do you know of any other quorum sensing bacteria examples? Um, I'm going to be really like a cheater. Haha, <laughs> how appropriate it would be. <laughs> because actually, what I was I think it was during my master's, I took like this course where I just had to write a paper. So I ended up writing a paper about gene regulation in different quorum sensing systems. And Pseudomonas was the one that I kind of featured. And one of the oh, big nice. things that um, was fun to write about with that is there was a lot of literature because Barbara Igluski's group was publishing a whole bunch of stuff. And a lot of the literature focused on these pathogenicity determinants. So with Pseudomonas aeruginosa, I think for those of you who know it in the medical microbiology context, it is one of those recurring infectious pathogens in the context of the cystic fibrosis lung. So the two response regulator genes that will be discussed in this paper further, uh, the LAS-R and the RHLR, are actually quorum sensing uh, response regulators that upregulate two pathogenicity determ determinants that are the namesake of both of those systems. So LAS is actually referring to a secreted protease that is responsible for hydrolyzing tissue and facilitating colonization, whereas the RHLR response regulator um, upregulates a lipid biosynthesis um, pathway for ramnolipid, which facilitates bio. bio so that's sort of what, a little bit of history for the quorum sensing components there. Um, so gl I'm so glad you know that because I did not have a chance to look that up and I was like, oh man, I bet that's really important, but I yeah. don't actually know what that I also worked in a lab where somebody was studying um, not necessarily a protease that's linked with that, with that particular circuit, but also we had a Pseudomonas aeruginous uh, protease that was being studied in the lab I did grant work in. So Pseudomonas is kind of like the Swiss army knife of, of squirting things out that chop things up. That's one of the things it does. But they also mention in the paper, there's a hint of it, that there's this third circuit of pleiotropic gene regulation, the quinolone system. And I can't really remember. Actually, I haven't stayed with that literature for a while. But I think when I wrote my, my lit review for that course back in 2002, it seemed like they thought that the and the reason I'm doing this is this is physically where it was in the diagram, is that the quinolone signal was sort of like this sort of master controller for like the LAS and the RHL systems underneath. So they actually were sort of hierarchically linked, but I am totally at this point like massacring it. And I'm sure that there's a Pseudomonas aeruginosa a person out there that, that yeah. That's <laughs> yeah. okay. That's better than I had. So I think we're yeah. good. <laughs> yeah. I'm happy about that. <laughs> Yeah. Um, okay, that, that helps because what, the, what they're setting up here in this paper, so they got the quorum sensing, um, as Nicole just beautifully explained, and I'm so glad you knew that because I was going to butcher that if, that if you hadn't done that, um, is that Pseudomonas has this quorum sensing system that's, the example that I used with Vibrio, the ultimate result was the production of light. For quorum sensing and Pseudomonas, in this paper in particular, they're interested in the ultimate product, which is these virulence factors, um, which contribute to disease, which Nicole just, just wonderfully described. Uh, so what they, their starting premise is that you're going to have pseudomonas that are uh, quorum proficient. So they actually have a functioning quorum sensing system. That system, if it detects cells at a high enough density, is gonna kick on production of the virulence factors those virulence factors are going to be secreted at the point that they're secreted when they're in the extracellular space, they become public good. So this is a term that people will get back to when they talk about cooperation, cheating, also game theory, so forth. Uh, but this idea is that these compounds these um, that get secreted, these virulence factors that get secreted, once they act, they're going to be able to benefit 
any pseudomonas in the vicinity, not just the pseudomonas cell that made them. So there's no way for a pseudomonas, a quorum proficient pseudomonas, to uh, tag the, the things that it secretes as being just for me. So once it sends them out of the cell, you know, any, any pseudomonas cell in the vicinity can benefit. What that means is that you can then get cheaters because it's actually, there's a fitness cost associated with making these virulence factors. So if you as a pseudomonas cell can uh, acquire a mutation that disrupts your ability to make those virulence factors or disrupts your quorum sensing system that controls making those virulence factors, you could still benefit from your neighbors who have an intact system that are pushing these virulence factors out. So that's why these quorum sensing deficient mutants they're going to be using in the paper are called cheaters. So they're basically looking at, in a population of pseudomonas, I think their ultimate goal, as Nicole mentioned, is thinking about this in an animal model or a human model, like looking at the lung, for instance, in cystic fibrosis. You've got a population of pseudomonas. Uh, there's going to be a proportion that are quorum sensing proficient, that are sensing density and making virulence factors. And you're going to have a population that is cheaters, that are quorum sensing deficient. And they are not going to be producing the virulence factors, but benefiting from the virulence factors produced by their friends, basically. Um, and those proportions, there's a lot of mathematical modeling that predicts how the proportions of those two will fluctuate uh, based on starting percentages and based on a lot of different factors. Um, before I launch into introducing the phage part of this, was there anything you wanted to add to that, Nicole? I actually really like the explanation of sort of the cheating and sort of the sort of social behaviors and behaviors and that I don't really have anything to say at this point. So we can keep going with the phage bits. Okay. All right. Cool. So, okay. So in the context of that, what they're now thinking about is bacteriophage. So bacteriophage are, um, as some people may know, viruses that infect bacteria. They, the host range of a particular phage is often dictated by uh, what it interacts with on the surface of a cell. So phage um, adsorb to the surface of a cell, but they're going to be interacting with different receptors on the bacterial cell surface. And so that can kind of dictate uh, which bacteria can be infected by particular phage. So here's the part where I had to think a little bit because I think I lost them a little on how they were um, framing this. So they talked about essentially they've got, let me see, in their introduction they start talking about phage and then phage as being a common source of stress for bacteria. And so they're saying that uh, there is some previous work that looks at the role of phage in selecting for or against quorum sensing systems. Now, um, they've seen this in, in, in Pseudomonas, so they said, um, they've got a section in the paper that I'll just go ahead and just read. So for Pseudomonas aeruginosa, it was recently shown that quorum sensing decreases infection by the lytic phages K5 and C11. However, the lytic phage PT7 decreases the Pseudomonas aeruginosa wild population density more than that of an isogenic mutant, which is deficient in the quorum sensing. So they've got evidence in the literature that phage are going to be preferentially interacting with quorum sensing proficient or deficient pseudomonas. That means because the phage infection, often if it's a lytic phage, it's, it's going to burst and kill your cell. So lytic phage infection is not a good thing for your pseudomonas cells. So that means if phage have a preference for interacting with one or the other, then that means they're going to select for the opposite. So if you have a population of pseudomonas, there are quorum sensing proficient and the cheaters that are quorum sensing deficient, and your phage is preferentially attaching to and affecting, infecting your quorum sensing deficient cells, then the thinking is that your quorum sensing proficient cells are going to be selected for because they're not getting killed off by your phage. Um, thoughts on that, Nicole? Right, so I also have to admit that I was 
a little confused by that, given what the rest of the evidence in the paper is. Is that where you kind of got? Yes. <laughs> but yeah, but I mean, the paper does focus on temperate phages. So I'm kind mm -hmm. of wondering the trick with Pseudomonas aeruginosa, I think. And I mean, it's the tr trick that I'm going to half acidly answer says is the trick that means we need to do more science. Is a lot going on when you think about the quorum sensing systems and why a phage might want to hang out in something that's quorum sensing proficient. So I'm wondering with lytic phages, there's some type of chemical or biochemical way that they are able to discern that a quorum sensing proficient population of or segment of a population of Pseudomonas aeruginosa is going to get the cell density they need to make good copies or oh, are, you, are you asking about what or, or like yeah what's in it for the phage kind yeah, of thing. yeah <laughs> yeah 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 um, yeah so i mean so, but but it's not very clear like whether that actually the these cost benefit biochemical aspects of phage infection are changing because it is lytic versus lysogenic mm -hmm. so maybe yeah. that's the thing because i can almost naively buy that a lytic phage is going to want to hang out in a quorum sensing proficient organism because if it's actually growth proficient and high density coordinating proficient that that might be a signal to the phage that it's like this thing is physiologically a well-tuned machine that's going to allow me to make all the copies of myself i need and then i can do my my chest burster business even though pseudomonas doesn't have a chest to just leave right you know. yeah yeah so so okay so i yeah. wondered so I, I mean, I admit I did not have, uh, given that it is towards the end of the semester, I didn't have a lot of time to kind of um, refresh my memory about quorum sensing in pseudomonas, which I have encountered before, but it was a while ago, and and not in. I don't. I don't. It's not something that I run across because I don't really work with pseudomonas, um, except for feeding it to my predatory bacteria. So, um, so I don't. What I'm, I, so, in terms of thinking about what do the phage get out of it. I mean, there, there's, there's, there's the there's the argument that it should have an adaptive effect, but then there's the argument that it's just an accident of, I don't know how similar the. So if there's if the quorum sensing system is producing things that sit on the outside of the cell that are the phage receptors, is it just that those those um, molecules look enough like other receptors that the phage use that that's it? It's not really. It's not really um, it's not really an evolved adaptive targeting of the quorum sensing system so much that it might be just enough structural or chemical similarity that it's just detecting. I don't see that I don't know. But okay, I no, I think you're hitting on something really important with this paper that I think is the big question and is that there's a plurality of trying to figure out how their data fits into the causal chain of understanding phage susceptibility. So first of all, you're right. We don't know if attachment is the only part of sort of the phage disease process in bacteria that's central to the results they're seeing. And secondly, mm -hmm. there are two quorum sensing systems. They're using a double quorum sensing system mutant. So what is the interplay of the two systems having to do with what they're seeing? They, I don't think they used any single response regulator mutants in this study. Like they didn't uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. I don't think they did. Yeah. That's true. So I think what they were aiming for is maximum quorum sensing dysfunction, not halfway, which right. I think is still an important, that's an important piece of the, well, to me, that's important. Maybe there's literature out there that says that's less. And I don't know, because I didn't do any reading outside of this paper before I got here. So, but as you, as you can see from this like, discussion, if you're thinking about yeah. joining our journal club, you don't have to have a lot of time to do background yeah. reading. No, we, no. We're okay with that. <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, maybe maybe let's do this. Why don't we um, yeah. Why don't we get into some of the data? Because yeah. I think that'll help us kind of. Because that's that's where I think you're absolutely right. It's connecting their data to their larger framework. Where I'm I'm kind of losing them a little bit. So maybe what we can do is kind of start walking through the data and figuring out where these connections do or don't work for us. Um, so so here's what they've got. They've got they they. They decided in their paper to study lysogenic phage or temperate phage. So these are phage that are going to, if you remember from your biology long ago, 
um, if you've got any students watching. This, these are your phages that are going to incorporate into the bacterial chromosome. They're, they're potentially not going to lyse right away. Um, and so that is a slightly different uh, stress that they're going to be looking at than you would get with lytic phage. So they've got two of these phage, um, D3112 and JBD30. These are the phage they're going to use to look at the interactions between phage, quorum sensing, and pseudomonas. And so one of the first things they did was they decided that they were going to look at phage production. Um, so this is basically just in your quorum sensing proficient kind of wild type pseudomonas, how much phage do you get? And in your mutants, how much phage do you get? So they did this, I'm gonna quickly do my screen share type of deal. Let me jump up here. Mm -hmm. There we go. No, sorry guys, I hadn't done this in a while. Uh, application window, perfect, perfect. Okay, so there we go. We've got, uh, in this panel we've got, um, figure one is on the left. And so figure 1A at the top, figure 1B at the bottom. And basically what they're looking at here is figure 1A at the top is looking at, you've got time on the x-axis, 0, 30 minutes after their time 0, and then 18 hours. And then on the x-axis, what they're actually looking at is recovery of viable cells. So this, is, this, this plot is going to tell us what the impact is on pseudomonas and pseudomonas viability if there is or is not phage. So uh, the white is wild type, so that's going to be your quorum sensing proficient pseudomonas. And then the kind of light gray is going to be wild type plus there's a phage. So you're going to see killing by the phage in a quorum sensing proficient. And then the slightly darker gray is going to be their quorum sensing mutant that's got, as Nicole has pointed out, both quorum sensing mechanisms knocked out. And then the very dark gray is your quorum sensing mutant that's deficient, then also infected by phage. Um, so the outcome to this of this is that it looks like we don't see any impact of phage infection when your pseudomonas is quorum sensing proficient in terms of viability. And you can see that by comparing the white and the light gray bars at 18 hours. So if you're looking at 18 hours, you just don't see any impact of having phage infection in a quorum sensing proficient pseudomonas. In your quorum sensing deficient pseudomonas, you actually see a little drop off at 18 hours with the uh, kind of medium gray bar. So that tells you that um, there's a little bit of drop off maybe because of the, of the double mutation, but it doesn't look like they felt that that was statistically significantly different from anything else. And then the key thing that they're pointing out here is that if you've got a quorum sensing mutant, and you add phage, then at 18 hours you see a significant drop in terms of the viable pseudomonas that you can recover. So the panel A says basically phage combined with quorum sensing deficient um, pseudomonas, you're going to see killing of pseudomonas, whereas the quorum sensing proficient pseudomonas appears to be protected. Does that seem right, Nicole? Uh, yes, I agree with the interpretation for sure. Um, okay. So we're just assuming that is is phage killing and not metabolic load. That's because of phage is well. I guess that's still technically phage killing. Um, if there's a burden on growth in the double mutant. Yeah, I don't I mean, think they split yeah. out like actual lysis yeah. versus. I don't think yeah. they split out. Yeah. Okay. Um, but then they've got panel B. So mm -hmm. this, this, so, so this, I thought I already got lost on figure one A or, or on figure one, and I thought, well, that's not good because so I was cool with with panel A, and then they show panel B, and so panel B is the same thing on the x-axis, and then on the y-axis, what you've got is plaque forming units. So this is a way of quantifying the amount of phage that they can recover, um, in these same in these same uh, conditions. So instead of four different conditions, what you've got is two, because basically you're taking the light gray bar and the dark gray bar, which are your quorum sensing proficient and your quorum sensing deficient that are exposed to phage, 
those are the only two you're going to have in this plot because otherwise you're not going to recover any phage because there's no phage in the treatment. Um, and so this is the bit that I found confusing because you've got more phage production in your wild type quorum sensing proficient pseudomonas than in your mutant. But the phage killing was more effective in the mutant background than in the wild type background. So I was puzzled by this. Yeah, okay, so I have feelings about this and, and I don't know if this is a Excellent. really good um, way of justifying, well not justifying, but thinking about panel B. And I think the thing that we sort of missed when we did our quorum sensing 101 earlier is that the key thing with quorum sensing circuits also, is not just that they're changing gene expression according to what the population size is, is that when the circuit gets turned on, LAS-R and RHLR are pleiotropic regulators, which means that they're are bunches of genes mm -hmm. that are shifting. And I mean, normal physiology is like that, but like, I'm kind of wondering if this, there's just some sort of interaction effect with this double quorum sensing mutant in terms of a whole bunch of other genes that cannot really, you know, adjust around the presence of a temperate phage that somehow a quorum sensing proficient system does. Only are these mutants less healthy with a phage in them, but they're also just not really good at, at doing the gene expression things that the phage needs to do because oh I see now the phage is there they're just dysfunctional. So what so what we might be talking about here is you Across might have differences in burst size we're in that pseudomonas mutant. That's that's my take on it. I mean it is a tempered phage, so I can kind of almost buy that like. They're going to be able to do their phage photocopying thing in the wild type strain. That's that's sort of where I'm at. So I'm just going to stop there. It may seem that's that's sort of how I'm looking at that data set in panel B. Okay. Okay. Um, so I hadn't thought about that, but do you think do you think that what's going so one of the features of phage is um, burst size. So that's basically you have a cell and then it gets infected by uh, a virus and the number of, of little viruses, um, oh, is my audio, oh, sorry. I, ha I might be having audio problems. Sorry if I'm having audio problems. Um, can you hear me okay now, Nicole? No? Um, I'm not sure if we're having a little bit of audio problem for me, but I'm going to go ahead with my thought here um, on the burst size thing. So I think, let's see, I don't have myself muted. Okay, I'm not sure what's going on. That's really weird. Um, all right, so sorry if you can't hear me. Is it, am I audio back? Maybe, maybe not. I don't so, know. So apparently when I unplugged my headset, your audio came back. So that's, it's more weirdness from my side. Oh, okay. All right. No problem. No problem. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. But I, what I was going to say is, so when you were going through your explanation of, of panel B, I hadn't thought about that. So, so what I think, so what I was saying um, is that um, in virus infection, what you've got is, is differences in burst size. So I think that's the term. Um, and that's a, you might, from a single cell infection, you could have a range of how many virus progeny are released. So you get virus infecting, and then that cell is going to release some number of viruses to go out and infect more cells. Um, I think that's called burst size, if I remember right. And so I think the point that you might, might be, I think that might uh, connect with your point just to say, if your mutants are sick or they're not they're not kind of controlling their metabolism and their gene expression in a normal way it could just be that they're not producing as many phage per burst or per cell as you'd get with your quorum sensing proficient yeah got it okay i also kind of wondered if they had taken 
like a, a like a time point at like six hours or twelve hours, what that would have looked like, because um, maybe there's some changes happening there that would would be interesting to see. Because right now you've got zero thirty minutes, and then you leap right to eighteen hours. Um, I was wondering about that too, just because I did look at the supplements and like their models, they have like a panel with the data, and I'm like, is there just more? And they extrapolated less with the data, but but I also am curious about that. Yeah. Because I wonder if part of it is just at 18 hours, your population of Pseudomonas is falling in your mutant. So it could just be that you're seeing a reflection of, you're seeing fewer phage recovered because your population of cells that can actually produce phage is dropping. Um, okay, that actually helps a little bit because I was, I just was perpetually confused by what I felt like was a disconnect between those two panels, but maybe it really isn't if you think about the phage biology and so forth. Other thoughts on figure one? Uh, not really. Um, I'm, I'm glad that it's clear for both of us because it, it is, it's weird, right? I mean, we don't really have any other index of Pseudomonas being sick other than density and have any phage for produce. So it's, it's really hard to know phenotypically what else is, is going on with these, these creatures right now, you know? Yeah, definitely. And I, and I, um, they come back to this point in their discussion. They actually come back to panel 1B and panel 1A and, uh, and kind of going, well, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> so I think they're aware too that it's, it might be counterintuitive to what some mm -hmm. people were expecting. Um, okay, so let's, let's go to, to figure two. So then what they're doing in figure two is they start doing um, competition experiments. So competition experiments are going to be where you have a mixed population of pseudomonas cells. So you're going to have, in a, in a flask, you're going to have um, quorum sensing proficient pseudomonas and quorum sensing deficient pseudomonas together. And then you're going to re release the phage upon them. It's like release the hounds, the phage comes out. Um, it sounds very fight clubby, you know that, right? <laughs> like it's it's, yeah, it does, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and who wins? It's like Thunderdome. Who comes out? One Pseudomonas enters. <laughs> no, you'd have to have more than that. Um, but what they're going to do is they're going to run these competitions. And so they're going to see, uh, first of all, uh, so let me pop back to the figure. Let's see if I can do this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, on the, so we're looking at the right now instead of the left. The right is figure two, and we've got panel A and panel B. And in panel A, they're looking at, uh, again, they've got time. In this case, it's zero, time zero, 10 hours, 24 hours. And then on the, on the y-axis, on panel A and panel B, they're, they've chosen to portray the data as what's the percentage of the mutant, the quorum sensing deficient pseudomonas at these different times. So you can kind of do the math yourself and figure out, well, what's the percentage of, of the wild type? They're just choosing to show it as one data point, which is percentage of the mutant. Um, their control is going to be no phage. So what would happen in somebody's lung if you had these two um, pseudomonas genotypes? That's what the white bars tell you. And uh, what you can see with the dark or with the gray is if you have phage added at either four hours for the light gray or eight hours for the dark gray. And then you can see the impact on the proportion of the cheater, basically. So this is, this is these two panels are meant to kind of get at the question of what does the presence of a functioning quorum system do for uh, control of, of cheating? Oh no, I'm sorry, other way around. What does the presence of a phage do to control cheating related to the presence of a quorum sensing system or not? Um, and so then the, as I understood it, the difference between A and B was basically A starts out with about 10% of the population being the cheater, and then B starts out with about 50% of the population being the cheater. And so they're testing different starting values for how much of a, how much cheater do you have in your population. Um, so then in A, when you start out with 10%, you're basically seeing, if you look at the no phage control, you're seeing what theory would predict, which is basically your cheater starts to take over. And you also see that in panel B, when you start with 50% of the population being the cheater, your cheater starts to take over. 
Uh, and that's pretty consistent from what I understand. That's pretty consistent with theoretical predictions, mathematical model predictions about what happens to a population when you've got a cheater that kind of sneaks in and starts um, using the public goods but not producing them. Um, so here's where I thought in panel A, they basically said that, you know, they kind of argued in the text that adding phage basically shows that you've got the proportion of cheaters controlled. But if I'm reading this right, none of that was statistically significantly different because they don't have any of those, none of those data have a little asterisk above them. That's correct. They also have some really interesting standard errors yeah like with this stuff um in panel a at least so yeah so i mean i would truthfully say that if we're gonna adhere to the statistical tests that they chose to do when you start with 10 percent of cheaters in your population you actually can't say anything completely confidently about the impact of phage on social on, on cheating that same nicole what do you think uh yeah, I agree with that. And part of me is now wondering whether a close read at the methods, because I'm assuming this happened in a shake flask. And it's the, the thing that I guess always um, humbles me about this is there's a lot of stochasticity in how these cells probably interacted with each other and dealt with the physical interfaces or even nutrient distribution in there. So it, it's, I can't remember if these are the averages of just three experiments, I guess. Y yes, yeah. I think they are. Yep. Because hmm. this is the only reason I remember that is because um, yeah, average of three, at least three independent cultures. So this this kind of reminds me of um, my students are doing a predation efficiency assays right now, where we're testing how effectively our predatory bacteria can kill certain prey, um, and so we're doing kind of uh, viable cell counts, CFU per mil counts, and we're taking time points. And and also yes, your point about stochasticity, um, it can it can move around a little bit and just just in the way that you're, when you're doing plates, I mean, because that's how they're getting these counts, I assume, is they're just, they're finding some way to plate them, I assume, um, to, to tell who's who. Um, okay, uh, so panel B, when they start with 50% of the population being cheaters, I think they can actually say something a little bit more definitive in terms of the impact of phage controlling social cheating, because you can see that there's a statistically significant difference if you add phage eight hours after combining the two types of pseudomonas, you're actually at 10 hours and 24 hours, you're actually seeing an impact of phage infection. You're seeing a drop off. Instead of an increase in your cheaters, you're actually seeing a drop off of the cheaters. So it's controlling this, uh, what would otherwise be the cheater taking over the population. The phage is actually suppressing that and kind of controlling the cheater. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of an interesting result in the sense that I kind of wonder whether it's just by starting with 50%, the phage actually gets a more frequent chance to sample the quorum sensing deficient versus the quorum sensing proficient pseudomonas. And based on, I guess, the phage experience in that cellular milieu, whatever it chooses to infect over the 24 hour period, um does something happen that it's now able to be like no i want to go i want to go with wild type mm. i don't know i don't know what kind of like that feedback is on the phage you know in terms of why it's better why why there's a more apparent result um that looks like cheater control in panel b yeah that's interesting huh hmm. does it start did it start as a da, 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 da. Yeah, that's interesting. Huh. Okay. Yeah. Um, this, this also gets back to just trying to kind of trying to understand what's actually going on with the biology here, which I, which I admit that I don't have a, a full grasp of. Um, the other, oh, I just wrote a little note. I, was, I knew there was something else I wanted to mention with this. I basically wrote a little note next to, next to this that it says, it, I, I wasn't sure if this really, if they could really say that it was a drop in numbers of the cheater or if it just basically the cheater never increased. Uh, because if it starts at like, you could see the line where it starts is about 
and the um, the error bars definitely include that 40 percent so I don't know if it's actually killing the cheater versus just controlling the cheater and keeping it at the level that it started at. I have no idea. Uh, but yeah, that was another thought I had. I, I agree with you. And I, I think the other thing to keep in mind too is panel A, or not panel A, figure one kind of also makes you wonder whether part of this, this cheater control is the phage again, making adjustments to its its choice of what it infects because it knows that it's not getting to make as many copies like that they're just getting crappy bursts out of out of the double mutant so in the end they're just like yeah well maybe i i don't know i don't know it's because there probably is the attachment part that they address later but yeah but that's I, true it's it's frustrating, but it's still interesting because there's a lot of this, like, what, again, is sort of the, the biochemical interpretation or interaction that's leading to this result. Because 24 hours still is a long time, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Interesting. Oh, okay, so, so maybe what we'll do is we'll, we'll, let me stop screen sharing for a second. So uh, off of this, then... What they wanted to do was they wanted to say, all right, so at, up to this point, they're using a lysogenic phage. I, up just, to this point. I noticed that said that we're no longer presenting, and I don't know if that's true. Oh, yeah. That, that's just, I took, the, um, I took the screenshot thing away. Okay, sorry. Okay. That's, that's okay. I'm going to record. I'm getting confused. Sorry. <laughs> oh, that's okay. I think we're still good. Um, so up to this point, they had they were at the the figure two, figure one and figure two when they're when they're looking at the impact of phage, they've just got phage in this in the system. They've just added phage, uh, but they're testing a lysogenic phage. So one of the things they decided to do was to actually um, test the impact of whether or not the pseudomonas is carrying the phage in its chromosome. So what they did was they uh, basically they took their quorum sensing proficient pseudomonas and then they have, um, I think they did this through, uh, they said it's a transposable phage. So I think what they were able to do is they were able to make constructs of both their quorum sensing proficient pseudomonas and their quorum sensing mutant that have the phage in, incorporated into their chromosome. So that is a potentially more realistic test of what they might see in a, in a patient or in the environment or so forth. And so what they did then is they said, okay, well, what impact does that have if our quorum sensing proficient strain has a lysogenic phage incorporated into its chromosome? What kind of impact is that going to have on cheating and on exploitation? And so that comes back to figure three, which gets into that. So I will go there. And then, um, oops, there we go. Hopefully I don't make anybody sick here. Um, but so that's, this is figure three, and essentially what they're looking at is, again, you've got time on the x-axis, percentage of the mutant on the y-axis, and then what we've got is your wild type. So what you can see here is wild type with the phage, the lysogenic phage in its chromosome, competed against the quorum sensing mutant. And what you can see happens, that's the black line. So when that happens, the just kind of we would expect from figure two, what ends up happening is that the mutant, the cheater, kind of drops off in terms of where its starting place is about 50%, and then I think it just drops off. So the that's indicating that the wild type is being protected by having this lysogenic phage. Um, they also looked at what happens if you have quorum sensing proficient pseudomonas without the lysogenic phage, but then you've got the lysogenic phage carried by the quorum sensing mutant. Um, and that, in that, that's the red, as expected. Like, there's there's nothing for the wild type to do. Not only is it getting out-competed by the cheater, but then the cheater is also protected by the phage. So in that case, the, the, the cheater basically ends up increasing in the population. Same thing happens when you have both strains carrying the lysogenic phage. If both strains are carrying the phage, then the phage doesn't appear to have any effect, and you see the same thing in the blue line. It basically tracks the red line, that the, uh, the mutant increases in percentage. And then the final thing they did was the green, where they looked at just the regular, what would you expect would happen? Um, and in that, as expected, 
the cheater takes over in the population. So the only time that you don't see the cheater taking over in the population by 24 hours is if only the quorum sensing proficient pseudomonas is carrying this lysogenic phage. Thoughts on that? Okay, I think now that you explain that these lysogens are our constructs, this is making a lot more sense to me in terms of, I think, where they're going with it. Because if in these scenarios or these experiments where they've got both of the strains, the, the quorum sensing proficient and quorum sensing dysfunctional containing the phage, the phage is already in a context where it's in a cell integrated, well, the, the genome is integrated into the host genome. So it's it's in something that's viable. So, I mean, the, the black lines basically kind of indirectly telling us that maybe entry and finding out what kind of host the quorum sensing deficient um, pseudomonas is, is one of the way, is, that is something that is central or potentially central to why the selectivity of the wild type versus the cheating strain might happen. So, I have, I guess I have other questions about that because it's sort of making me wonder like, is there something equalizing the genomic context or some other thing physiologically that's relevant to these, these lysogens when they're just made and plunked into culture versus, I don't oh, know. Oh, yeah. oh, okay, I see where you're going with that, interesting. I mean, there's something about sort of, I guess, where in the disease process, if we call the phage infection a disease process for the pseudomonas, um, it's relevant for, for the phage to kind of modify who it's, who it's choosing based on the effect of it trying to choose to get into, you know, get into one bacteria versus the other, or possibly getting in and deciding whether it's just going to kill it because I don't know, it's not really helping make more copies. Whatever that interplay has to be that's allowing the double mutant to, to not do so well when you've got the, the wild type lysogen in play. Right, right. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, that, I don't know that they discussed that that much in the paper, but yeah, that's an interesting point that just having the phage present in the, in the medium versus actually having it in its genomic context expressed and, and the only way you're going to get phage is when it gets expressed and assembled by cells rather than just adding phage that's already been made. Um, that's interesting. Yeah, this paper's funny because a lot of what happens when I, when I, as I'm going through this is that I just end up going, huh, and then I have nothing enlightening to say beyond that. <laughs> that's okay, they're, though. Because their writing's really clear, and I think they're, they're careful about not I, I think by the end, they're just like, there's a lot of stuff we don't know. But then yeah. they're trying to figure out the translational value. Yeah, yeah. They I mean, they're definitely honest about, like, here's some stuff we just don't know yet. Um, and I think that's good. Um, okay, so maybe what we'll do is we'll scoot on to figure four, because that's when we get um, our, poor, our, our poor infection model. Our poor creature has to, uh, has to get infected. So they, they, they essentially want to see this, what goes on in vivo. Because their ultimate goal here is to is to talk about phage infection and how it might play a role when you've got a human infection of pseudomonas going on, um, and so what they're going to do is they're going to basically take their same system, and they're going to look at <clears throat> excuse me, they're going to look at in these larvae, they're going to look at it's a, essentially a competition assay, but they're doing it in larvae instead of doing it in a flask, and so I'm going to bounce us to that figure very quickly. So that's going to be on your right. So what they're looking at is kind of like figure one. The top part is going to be, uh, they're looking at recovery of viable quorum sensing mutants. And then the bottom part is actually looking at recovery of phage. So the bottom panel B is going to be about phage production. The top panel A is going to be about survival of the cheaters in this, in this um, animal model. And so what you've got is um, no phage is, is on the top panel, A. No phage is in black. So that's just the two, the quorum sensing proficient and the quorum sensing mutant together in the larvae. 
And in that case, what they're showing is basically it looks like you've got a slight increase in the cheater. Um, but if you add either of the two phage that they're interested in, that's the red and the blue, your cheater drops off. So in this case, your, um, your phage is controlling the cheater because it is a quorum sensing deficient mutant, that means that it isn't producing the virulence factors, which means that your phage is actually selecting for your more virulent pseudomonas in the animal model. So if you're an animal or a human patient, they make this point that that's not good, that you're actually getting more virulent pseudomonas selected for when you have this phage. So this is, at, at one point in the paper, they talk about potential implications for phage therapy, which I thought was really interesting. This idea that um, people are, I mean, and we're kind of doing something similar with our predatory bacteria. Can you use a microbe as a biocontrol agent? So there's a lot of people, and phage therapy is much farther along in terms of looking at whether or not, instead of giving someone a chemical antibiotic, can you treat them with a phage? And I think this is an interesting point that they're making, that they're saying, well, you have to think about some of these repercussions because what we're showing here is that the phage are controlling for some phage are going to be selecting for your more virulent pseudomonas. So if, if you don't have, depending on the dynamics of how the treatment works and the person's immune system, their ability to help clear out the infection, you could potentially see things get worse, I think is their argument. Um, thoughts on that? Yeah, I actually, I really like like this figure because it sort of provides that contrast to the culture conditions where like a host really is, it's a thing that is gonna have, you know, immune and, and, and biochemical responses to, to infection, which means that compared to the shake flask, we now have an environment that can exert spatial inequities and physiological inequities to the two things trying to infect depending on whether you can deploy your your pathogenicity determinants. So I think that's really an interesting contrast to see to some of the earlier experiments that being in a host really increases that that phage selectivity for suppressing the cheater. And it totally makes sense because this is an environment where I'd expect that there's probably a quantifiable effect size on on how population numbers dynamically increase for the quorum sensing proficient versus deficient. In addition to the fact that like, if the quorum sensing deficient mutants can only get a foothold in a, in a tissue compartment or something that isn't sharing, you know, biofilm or isn't sharing a colony where say the quorum sensing proficient stuff is, then you actually are making, the public goods are just incidentally becoming less public. So right, maybe, so so maybe there's an exacerbation of just not being able to be opportunistic that happens in a host that it doesn't happen in a flask, you know? Yeah, that's true. I think that's a really interesting point. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm glad they did the animal model stuff. I think, it, I think it adds a different, just like you said, I think it adds a different element to it. And this is, if this is where they're ultimately headed in thinking about this, if you're thinking about phage infection in the context of a host, um, for, for the bacteria, so the host of the host, I guess, um, then you've got to think about all these other, other things that are these uh, moving parts, these other factors, these other mechanisms, like immune system response that's going to be at play. Um, just for the interest of time, what I thought I would do is, uh, I think we kind of hinted at some of what they talked about with phage therapy and how they're kind of uh, considering the implications of their findings for ph phage therapy, which I think is really exciting. Um, but they also had a uh, mathematical simulation, which helps them kind of talk a little bit more about possible implications for phage therapy. And so I just wanted to pop to that really quick. Um, so here's that. Uh, the graph is a little bit difficult to read. Uh, so what you're looking at basically is they've got four different conditions. A is no phage. B is a small amount of phage applied at 10 hours, C is a large amount of phage applied at 10 hours, and D is a small amount of phage applied at three hours. So what they're in the text, what they discuss is that B and C are meant to kind of give them some indication about 
you have a person whose infection has gotten to the point that they have symptoms. So they are like, it's clear that they've got pseudomonas. It's clear that something's going on. The population of pseudomonas has increased to a point that now you know you have to do something about it. And then three hours in the text, they kind of discuss it as, well, what would happen if you could detect the pseudomonas early enough before it hits the cell densities that it starts activating the quorum sensing system and the virulence factors are getting produced? What if you could detect pseudomonas at low enough numbers that you could hit them with a phage before they even ramped up their quorum sensing system? Um, and so what they're doing here is they're looking at the, the differences between the wild type, the quorum sensing proficient, which is the solid line, so that's the slightly darker line, and then the uh, quorum sensing mutant, the pseudomonas, that can't do quorum sensing, the cheater, is going to be in the slightly kind of, uh, the kind of dotted looking line, the fainter line. And so the panel A kind of does the obvious thing that we would expect. Basically, the cheater takes over. You can see the swap happen in proportions, and the cheater kind of, kind of runs rampant. Um, but if they apply a small amount of phage at 10 hours, they can kind of see that in panel B. What ends up happening is it's able, the cheater spikes, but when the phage get at, added, it actually manages to knock the cheater off. But then you get your quorum sensing proficient, more virulent pseudomonas kind of taking off. Um, and then if they set it C, if they add enough, if they can dose, like if you're thinking about a patient in C, they're like, okay, well, we're going to do the same thing as B, but we're going to hit the patient with a higher dose of phage. If they do that, if they use a high enough dose of phage, they can actually take, they can eliminate the entire pseudomonas population. Or if they can figure out how to detect pseudomonas in a person before it starts activating its quorum sensing system in D, they can use a small amount of phage, so the dose isn't as important as the timing in that case. Um, so I just wanted to make sure we hit this because I thought it was they, I thought it was interesting how they tested each of these combinations of factors just in thinking about how complex it's going to be to try to use phage therapy in a patient. It's not just going to be like, well, we're just going to wash them with some phage and then let's hope something happens. I don't know. Um, Nicole, did you have thoughts on that? You know what I. I loved your explanation of this, and I actually, I mean, this uh, this more than the little attachment test that that, that did also happen at the end of the, the results section. It's fine, but I mean, this is actually kind of a big deal, and I think this is a really important teaching point, especially, I don't know, especially if you were talking about this, say, in the context of, like, medicinal chemistry, is that, you know, the nice thing with antibiotics, I guess, is that they're very specific in, in their target, and with this, the big risk with phage therapy that these these numerical simulations show is that you're actually trying to deal with a population that has a different amount of physiological compatibility for the phage. So you, what you don't want is a treatment that's either going to spike something that's more virulent or merely change your population structure, which isn't actually helping somebody get better. <laughs> so... So this is a very, and, and also, if you are going to try to deploy it early, how do you do that if, if you have a pre-symptomatic phase that you can't detect? So there's all these other pieces of, of what other parts of disease surveillance need to come in to make phage therapy generally successful, and how, what are the benefit to risk ratios? Do we really know? Um, and this is also where being more discriminatory about what your animal model might be is a really key thing to think about when we start thinking about how to apply this to people because i don't really know how a moth physiology is going to allow this to play out in ter especially in terms of like bodily compartment so i think it's it's really cool that they did this simulation at the end because it's addressing a lot of the ecology it's addressing you know where we're going with antibiotic resistance is how do we think about how do we think about using um, antimicrobial arsenal components that aren't very structure function linked tightly? Like we really don't understand the full selectivity. And maybe with the attachment data, what they're getting at is do we need some sort of adjunct to the treatment that actually makes something more 
prone to being, you know, phage susceptible because we can somehow short circuit the down regulation in a quorum sensing proficient strain by blocking something so that it's expressing a whole bunch of attachment points instead so that you do knock out both the quorum sensing deficient thing and the quorum sensing proficient. So we haven't left these other structure function questions. And ideally with reductionist medicine, when you hone in on something that's almost like a lock and key fit, you've almost got it. And with phage, because it's a living thing, there's probably a lot more bottlenecks to developing really sharp resistance profiles. So it's definitely still worth looking at. But as we can see, it's actually thinking about the whole community trajectory to figure out how to make this medically useful. And I've said a lot there. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's great. I think that was that was a good um, that was a good summary and a good a good kind of concluding concluding set of statements about about the paper itself and then its further implications. Um, yeah, I I I think all of that. I'd second all of that. Um, I think this was a good paper to read. This was one you suggested. Um, I think this is a good paper to read. For me, I kind of always end up thinking about this stuff in context of our predatory bacteria, because uh, it's a similar type of idea. But certainly with um, seeing a lot more uh, discussion about phage therapy, there, there have definitely been a couple of reports of successful phage therapy. So we know that it's promising and we know that in certain circumstances it, it will work. Um, but, but understanding these dynamics and understanding how uh, the interplay of all of these factors is not only interesting from a theoretical standpoint, but but it also has some very important applications. Um, well, I, I, we're about an hour, and I'm always reluctant to keep people after an hour. So, do you have any final thoughts you wanted to make about this paper? I think what you just said was fantastic, but in case you had any kind of closing remarks, I think the only thing I'd want to say is that there were things in the reference section that, if I had time, I would look because apparently there is a paper about when it would be appropriate to use temperate phage versus lytic phage and phage. Oh, therapy. cool. That would be kind of an interesting reference to kind of look at, you know. Yeah, definitely. I didn't catch that. I, I'll have to go look for that because that's, that's an interesting yeah, idea. That's an interesting, and a lot of the literature is really recent that's published in here too. So I think this is a cool paper to actually use in the classroom because of the other things it connects to in addition to thinking about what people have thought about as sort of a game plan for implementing phage in a therapeutic context. Yeah, um, I'll say for my for my closing thoughts, I'll say that the first time I read this through, I thought, I don't think I could use this in a class because I just, I felt like, I felt like there was too much that you had to get, kind of get sorted. Um, but reading it again and then discussing it, I think the implications are really cool. So where you arrive at, I think there's some papers that. For, for students, there's some papers that for students in a classroom, the work they put into understanding it doesn't have a lot of a payoff. Uh, and that's just the nature of some scientific articles. There's like, because students are really looking for a ba -da at the end, and not all papers have that, and that's okay. Um, but so sometimes they kind of power through papers and they get to the end and they're like, well, we didn't, we didn't really learn a whole lot. <laughs> but I think for this paper, the pay, for them to work through it, the payoff by the time you get to figure five and you're now starting to think about medically relevant applications for the data that they've just generated, I think that's a, I think that's a payoff. I think that's something where you get to the end and if, they, if they've got it, if they followed, if they understand, you get to figure five and you go, oh, so this could tell you as a physician what are the factors you have to consider and what are the costs and benefits to using phage to treat a patient. Which, you know, for some of our medically, like, health profession student focused students, that's something that they can latch on to. Um, so I, I think I'm, I'm teaching microbiology next semester, so I have to decide which papers I'm going to use. I might try this one. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> um, but I can report back, basically. The cool thing about this paper, too, is it fits both with the medical students and with the microbial ecology. Like, there's a lot for both of those subjects. So you could even deploy it twice and start it's to true. Versus. It's true. I think I think what it would require is 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 being positioned at the right time in the semester so that we've talked about phage, we've talked about like quorum sensing, and we've kind of talked about some of these things. Um, so I'd have to see where that might be when I'm putting my syllabus together over Christmas, <laughs> as everyone does. Um, okay. Well, I um, 
since it's an hour, I think we'll, we'll stop there. Uh, so I want to thank Nicole, as always, for, uh, for being here and suggesting this paper. Um, I always learn a lot from reading these papers, and I always am really grateful that uh, people make time to, and, and Nicole made time to, to read it also and discuss it with me. Um, as I said at the beginning, if anybody has watched this far, if you watched this far, you should come talk to us when we do these, uh, because you're very clearly going to get something out of it. And we always welcome new people um, who have interesting thoughts. And as you might tell from having watched this discussion, we don't always have everything worked out. So we kind of do it as a true journal club, where we kind of work through it as a group. Um, and it always helps to have multiple perspectives. So with that, I'll say, oh, I will say, I think we're probably going to take a break in December because December gets really dicey with people going on break and, and vacations and travel. So we're going to take a break for December. Hope everybody has a good holiday. And then we'll be back in January. And if in the meantime, people have suggestions for papers, absolutely feel free to suggest them. So with that, I, um, I'll say bye and we'll uh, stop our broadcast.